All right, um, we're, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll probably get some students walking in <laughs> late. Um, but thank you all for coming today. And we put this together on pretty short notice as I found out that David was going to be touring in New Jersey at three other universities and I grabbed him and we're actually the first stop on his tour. So thank you for being so accommodating. Um, we do have some food in the back, uh, courtesy of the facilities department. We have some pizza, some soda, some water, and even a vegan pizza and a little information back there about vegan and vegetarian diets if you're interested. Um, this presentation is being hosted by the Sustainability Committee here at uh, the college, which I chair, which is faculty and staff uh, planning events and, and uh, improving the environment here on campus, and also the Environmental Club, which is the student club um, here on campus, and uh, we have a representative from the club here, um, Allison Burkhart, to uh, introduce David for us. So, Allie, if you could come up. Hey, thanks for coming today, everyone. I'd like to introduce to you David Thorson, a professional photographer and explorer from Lake Okoboji in Iowa. He has filmed a TV documentary in which he was nominated for an Emmy in 2011. He has ran for magazine articles and television programs, and he has his own fine art gallery and has written a book. He has had the privilege to sail on the Arctic for an expedition on the Northwest Passage, which is infamously challenging. He and his crew were the first American group who successfully navigated this passage in both directions. Um, he first attempted this in 1994, and after icy conditions almost gave his crew a life or death situation, he tried again 13 years later. Um, he got to experience firsthand all the severe climate change. So here he is today at RV to talk to us about all the critical conditions he experienced and his journey. Let's give a big round of applause and thank you for Mr. Thorson. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. That was um, a big part of my story, so maybe I don't even have to speak today. Thank you very much. Um, this is the first stop today. Um, I'm in New Jersey for uh, three days, and uh, I'm very, very happy that we could get this little event thrown together uh, in such short time here at um, RV. Is that what you call yourself here, RV? We had uh, Raritan Valley. Thank you, Sue. And um, thank you, Monica and the Alaska Wilderness League and some of the other groups that are involved in this whole tour that I'm involved in out here on the East Coast. I've not been to New Jersey before except to fly into New Jersey to go over to New York. So I'm happy to spend some time actually in New Jersey and meet some folks and tour the state, which I'm very excited about. So uh, yes, I am a professional photographer and I am a sailor from Iowa, which is quite a rare thing as probably many of you know. I was a very landlocked state, but we do have some bodies of water there, and I was very fortunate to grow up in our one area that we call the Iowa Great Lakes, which is a group of, of glacial lakes there in northwest Iowa, and that's where I learned to sail. Now, uh, this image that's up on the screen is one of my very special images from the Arctic Ocean, and uh, it really kind of sums up to me a, a lot of what the Arctic is all about and that is uh, big seas, big winds, um, unpredictable energy out there, and um, a very spiritual quality of, of being in those elements in remote places in the world, which is what I really love to do. And so I will just get started, and I'll tell you my story through photographs, because as a photographer, that's what I specialize in and love to do. So this is the lake that I grew up on. It's called Lake Okoboji. And uh, it, it is a glacial lake, and we don't often stop to think about what that means. And in my story that I tell, it means something quite spectacular because this was a lake created by a changing climate, by climate change itself some 15,000 years ago by a receding ice sheet. But in more of the slow, slow kind of geological time frame that we think of with, with our Earth's history and this long-term thinking that um, now is being changed by short-term man-made climate change. 
I grew up sailing there on this little lake. This is me sailing with my mother. My mom taught me how to sail as a little boy. And uh, so I grew up sailing on this little lake. That's my sister there. And on the name of, uh, on the back of my boat, you can see the name of it is Help Upside Down. If you look at it closely, and believe me, I needed that many times as a little boy learning to sail. And I continued to sail and race. We raced these boats uh, still in Iowa. And that's me, number 2181, sailing in a regatta uh, there at Okaboji. So we have nationally... Um, organized regattas there and uh, we have the inland national championships and things like that things that are not heard of out here on the coast too much but we do have sailing we do have a lot of water sports there and I continued to sail and photograph and I kind of changed my plans along the way some of you students out there I had planned on going to medical school and the photography and travel bug kind of took hold with me, and I decided that I wanted to change my life and try something different in the world, and I figured that sailing and photography were kind of the two vehicles that could take me to new places that I had never been to before. Now, people always ask me, David, you're from Iowa. What was your pathway to the ocean? How on earth did you make it from Iowa to sail all around the world like you've done, and the answer is really easy. I met a southern Minnesota hog farmer, and the rest is history. And this is a true story. This is my mentor in sailing, Roger Swanson, who was a southern Minnesota farmer. Uh, he has now passed away, unfortunately, but not before becoming one of the most famous sailors in the United States history. Uh, he had sailed over 200,000 miles around the planet, and um, after he passed away, he was selected as America's off, uh, finest offshore voyager of the past 30 years. Uh, so he, is, uh, he was a terrific mentor and sailor. And together, we sailed all over the world on his beautiful sailboat named Cloud Nine, a 57-foot catch. Uh, a catch means that it has two masts has a main mast and a mizzen mast, and flies four sails. We carried 17 sails on board, and Roger was an old retired Navy seaman, so we did everything by the book, and uh, we had, every time we got into trouble, he methodically would um, guide us and help us get out of the trouble that we were into. So we had numerous problems, many times, lots of storms, but we always worked our way through it, always in an orderly fashion, and... Uh, always survived to tell the tales afterwards. So Roger introduced me to the bigger elements of the world's climate systems, the, the huge weather systems surrounding Antarctica, uh, sailing through snow down there as we sailed south, and really introduced me to these forces that comprise the world's um, weather and climate systems. And really when you're out there on the ocean is when you understand how humbling it is, how big this world is, how rough the waters are, and what you have to do to survive out there in any condition and be adaptable to everything. So together, first of all, we sailed down to Antarctica in 1991 and 2. This is Cape Horn right here, the most infamous sailor's landmark in the world, and this is the toughest stretch of water in the world called the Drake Passage. It's about 600 miles down to the Antarctic Peninsula from there, and you have to run through a stretch of water with these uh, circulating vortex winds, catabatic winds that can run up to 100 miles an hour easily and 40 to 60 foot seas can uh, attack you from any direction at all times. So you have to pretty much be ready for anything. And of course, there's icebergs that you sail by and, and hopefully do not run into. Um, and the little bergy bits are the most dangerous that trail off from the bergs. You can see the, the bergy bits here. Now on the calm days in the Antarctic and also the Arctic, you can get up close to the icebergs, which is really great. But in the rough weather, especially with less visibility, you want to stay away from those things because they are so hazardous. They have a lot of trailing ice, and some of the ice, the smaller bits, are as big as this room. And they will look like a white cap that is breaking. So when you have 30 or 40 foot waves, 
and you have these great big chunks of ice bobbing up and down in the ocean, you can go up on the crest of a wave, come down in a trough, hit one of these things, and you will be broken right in half, and that will be the end of your day for sure. So uh, sailing in, in these remote areas of the world is very treacherous indeed. But it does allow you to get into some of these areas, um, like along the Antarctic Peninsula, where we were introduced to the Adelie penguins, the chinstrap penguins, some of the, uh, the other rare penguins down there. And it was the first time for me where I could actually get out with scientists and see what they're doing in the field. We actually went to Palmer Station down there, met with scientists, got out in the field, and went to some of these penguin colonies where we could see how the penguins were living, what their habitat was. And one of the things that we discovered since Roger was a hog farmer was that um, penguin colonies smelled just as bad as a hog farm. So we could always smell them before we could see them, which was uh, uh, made them very easy to find out there. But the Adelie penguins are very much threatened along the Antarctic Peninsula right now, especially the Adelies, because of the warming habitat. The Antarctic Peninsula is the fastest warming place on the planet. They have lost about 90% of their ice sheets there, and uh, they have a lot of exposed bedrock, which is heated up. It's that positive feedback loop that I will talk about with the Arctic also, how uh, warming ocean creates more dark water because of melting ice, which warms the water, also warms the bedrock, which melts more ice, and it just kind of feeds on itself, and the Adelies are being very much affected by this. Well, it was while we were sitting down here in Antarctica, and we were near the end of it, that Roger out of the blue says, uh, David, how would you feel about sailing north? We've kind of been down here to Antarctica now, and uh, what, what would you think about sailing to the Northwest Passage? And I said, uh, wow, this would be fantastic. Um, it's going to take a little time to digest this uh, trip to Antarctica and preparing everything. And he said, yeah, sure. How about uh, 1994? That will give us two years to prepare, prepare for the voyage, get the boat back up to the north. And uh, so we decided that in the summer of 1994, 21 years ago, that we would first try the Northwest Passage. Now, the Northwest Passage, uh, how many of you are familiar with this historic route? Have you done a little research? Yeah, OK. So the Northwest Passage, historically, is a route that was going to come from Europe and go over the top of the world and into the Pacific Ocean, eventually, from the Atlantic to Pacific to look for a shorter trade route so that the sailors of old wouldn't have to go all the way down around Cape Horn and back up in order to get to those lucrative uh, trade routes there in, in the east. And so the idea was to find a shortcut to go through this area near the North Pole and um, create this route that would knock off thousands and thousands of miles. Unfortunately, for about 400 years, this was impossible. And there are many, many stories that are great, great reading about some of these expeditions to the far north. Most of them ended up in extreme peril and lots of misery and, and death. And if you like reading about such things, uh, especially on a, on a hot summer day to cool you off, I, I guarantee it'll do the trick. But Raoul Dominson, who I'll mention a little bit later, was the first one to go through the Northwest Passage just about 100 years ago. And you see the dates there, 1903 to 1906. That's four years and three seasons frozen in the ice in order to get it done. And the modern boat era was introduced in 1977, just 17 years before we had tried in, in 1994. That was the first person, Willie DeRoos, to go through the Northwest Passage um, in a small boat in the modern era. Now, it looks something like this. When you, uh, you go up the west coast of Greenland with a current, you go across Baffin Bay, duck into Lancaster Sound here, and then move south through these channels over the top of the entire continent of North America, follow this route, go over Alaska, down through the Bering Sea, and eventually end up in the Pacific Ocean. That's about 7,000 miles. It kind of looks like this as you're beating along. This is just kind of a normal day at sea when you're out there. And uh, you can imagine if you're trying to sleep up there in the bow, how that works. Not too well. You kind of feel like an astronaut, and your stomach leaves you many times 
as you're traveling along there. So rough sailing, there we go. We're heading off from Nova Scotia and Newfoundland up north through this Davis Strait and into Baffin Bay, big seas, trying to avoid ice, and finally hitting the west coast of Greenland. Now the west coast of Greenland is tricky because the ice parts and you work on a lead, a shore lead that develops through the summer months because the warm current is melting the ice offshore off the west coast of Greenland so you work up north as the season goes along in 24-7 daylight. And you anchor in beautiful little harbors like this in Umanak that are just above the Arctic Circle. Uh, and we were all alone. We were the only sailboat at the time heading north and finally you get up to little communities in the far north. This is the little town of Upernavik which is 600 miles north of the Arctic Circle now. So we're at about 75 degrees north latitude. That is very far north. If you look at a globe you're way up there toward the top at this point and um, this was our last provisioning point where we could stop and get a few supplies before we headed now west and over toward Canada. Traditionally, the ice splits. There's a northern ice pack, there's a middle ice pack. This ice splits, and you split that ice pack and head right across this line and over to Canada. That's what the ancient mariners used to do, and there's very good historical records of this. So you enter the Northwest Passage. It's a very, very foreign land, and uh, it kind of scares you uh, seeing these clouds all the time that form and conditions change very rapidly in the Arctic, so you have to be on your toes. And there's a very charged history that you meet immediately. We stopped in Erebus Bay, and this is the home of the first winter where the Sir John Franklin expedition overwintered. Now, three of the crew members died during this first winter in 1845. All 129 men would eventually die over the next couple years in this expedition that was trying to discover the Northwest Passage, these three were the lucky ones because I guarantee the rest of them died a horrible wretched death from lead poisoning and exposure over the course of the next couple of years. Very interesting side note and read, one of their two vessels, Erebus, was just discovered by underwater archaeologists last year. And uh, there's lots of uh, notes on the internet about that. So uh, do a search for uh, her Majesty's ship, HMS Erebus, and uh, take some notes on that. Very interesting story. And of course, the Brits used big ships, not small, nimble vessels. They had um, typical Brits, um, too big of vessels, too many men, poor clothing, and bad food. So a typical British expedition to the Arctic. It's no wonder that it, that it failed. Um, and we were wondering if our fate would be the same because we started running into solid ice after we tried to head south. We got as far north as we needed to. We we're trying to gain our, our southern channels now, and we just couldn't do it. We got stuck in the ice almost every way that you can possibly be stuck in the ice. And for two weeks, we battled and battled trying to get out of the ice. There was another sailboat that we discovered that was up there with us, a little French boat. So there were two boats and nine people in the entire Northwest Passage in 1994 trying to get through. And this is what it looked like for us along the way. Um, I would get out as I could to try to take some shots, but this is what happened. This is what we saw. This was the pack ice in 1994, solid, impenetrable ice that we could not get through because we were not an icebreaker. In fact, we were a fiberglass sailboat, not even a steel vessel. So we were in danger of losing our vessel. And in every expedition, there is a go, no-go date. And we reached the end of August, and it was time for us to uh, make our exit. So slowly, we retreated back out of the Arctic. We got ourselves out of the ice and retreated out of the Arctic some 3,000 miles, and the Northwest Passage had won again. We did not make it that year. So fast forward now, 1994 to 2007. 1994 was a little pre-internet, uh, personal computers were not really online yet, no satellite communication, not very good GPS, and uh, now all of a sudden we have satellites, we have uh, internet, we have availability of me being able to look at satellite data. Uh, look at the same data that the scientists were looking at, and something was changing in the Arctic. And not just the Arctic, this is Lake Okoboji in Iowa in January. 
And for the first time in recorded history, the lake didn't freeze in the winter. This was happening all through the upper Midwest in that winter of 2006 and 7, all the way up through Canada, and it also looked like the Arctic was um, facing a year with much less ice. How much less? We didn't know, but Captain Roger Swanson was 75 years old, and he wanted to give it one last shot to go through the Northwest Passage. So off we went again, back up to the west coast of Greenland, um, stopping by icebergs along the way when we could to take some beautiful photographs on these calm days. We called them halcyon days that were just beautiful and calm and sunny. And these were the days you wanted to work north when, when we got this high pressure and it was very calm because we could motor and have um, no effect from big seas and ice being pushed around. When the time was right, we headed west again across Baffin Bay. This time, though, no ice. Baffin Bay was completely ice-free. We entered Lancaster Sound and entered the Northwest Passage. Absolutely no ice whatsoever. The ice had completely disappeared. We got back to the exact same place where we were in 1994, and guess what? No ice in 2007. The ice had completely disintegrated and gone away in the summer of 2007, and this is what it looked like. It looked like we might as well be on Lake Okoboji in the summer. It was completely ice-free, and I'll show you a little video here. Hopefully it will play. It did not play. I wonder if that's because of this cord. Is this set up for video? I mean, <coughs> played my other one. Yeah? Hmm. Doesn't want to play that one for some reason. But, bummer. Okay, well, we'll pass up that little video. Um, the polar bears were just as confused as we were about what was going on. They were looking at us. We were looking at them. And uh, they didn't know what to do, and we were just as profoundly affected as they were um, by what we were seeing in the Arctic. Now, we didn't know what was going to happen to these two bears because there was no ice for them to go find their food supply. So they were going to have to go swim off a long distance to find their food out on the ice somewhere, and this little cub was not really in a good position to swim very far. As some of you know, they're having to swim um, 200, 300 miles sometimes to find food, and they're getting very emaciated along the way without this uh, food supply. Now, this is something, uh, this is a shot I took in Antarctica, and you can see it's very, very white. And something that I realized over the course of time through my photographic career was I got very upset that I was getting pictures like this in the Arctic. And this is something that I started seeing more and more was uh, aerosols in the atmosphere and black carbon pollution that's circulating around our globe right now and depositing on snow fields, especially in the north. You've probably heard of this in Greenland. Well, it's happening all over the place where dark matter from wildfires, from industrial pollution in the atmosphere, fossil fuel burning, and uh, just the disturbance of this constant development with so many people on the planet is sending fine particles up into the atmosphere and depositing them on white snow surfaces. And this is causing melting in the Arctic. You can see even on these chunks of ice um, that we're going through, they're all darker than usual. And this is probably the trigger that initiated this melting in the Arctic that started this positive feedback loop now. Again, look at black carbon pollution, uh, especially in the Arctic regions right now. So onward we went, summer of 2007. No ice in the Arctic. We sailed through. It was beautiful sailing for us. And along the way, we made it through the Northwest Passage. We became the first American sailboat to ever accomplish this route. 6,694 miles we went through the Arctic and never touched one piece of ice along the way. We did this in 73 days in one season. Compare that to Raoul Amundsen that took three and a half years and three seasons frozen into the ice trying to push through along the way. So I definitely felt very proud of our accomplishment, but I thought there should be a little asterisk that we got an assist by a quickly changing Arctic environment that includes just less ice. Well, how much less ice? In 1994, this was us, 
And this is the satellite record. So we launched our satellites in the late 1970s. Um, this is the accurate satellite record. So we still had about close to 7 million square kilometers of ice in 1994. Look at 2007. By the time we hit 2007, we were in between 4 and 4.5 four and million square kilometers of ice. So in my short 13-year career of exploring the Arctic, we lost over 40% of our northern polar ice cap in that time frame. So that is outside the normal cycle, the normal ge geological time frame that we're looking at would change to this planet within natural cycles. Something was happening to this planet, and we were there to witness uh, history, actual planetary history taking shape in the summer of 2007. So this is, uh, this is interesting. That's a little graphic from National Geographic. Um, they just changed their atlas. Did any of you read about this? They just put out a brand new atlas for 2015 that now is reflecting what has happened to our northern polar ice cap to show that there just is less ice now in the Arctic in the summer. And it is now um, estimated by scientists that we have lost 80% of our ice to our northern polar ice cap because not only are we losing the surface area, we're losing volume because this new first-year ice is not as thick. It's not as thick as multi-year ice. So this is now what it looks like, and Geographic, Nat Geo, has now um, shown that we have a changing Arctic environment. So this, uh, this also changed my life. It had such a profound impact on me that I decided that the climate change issue was something that I needed to be more involved in personally. And for those of you exploring careers, uh, this is how it happens. Uh, things don't happen in straight lines. When you become an explorer or really interested in subjects, they meander. And my career has been very much this meandering where I was interested in the environment, but not really focusing on one key issue. And to me, climate change has galvanized it, and um, I think it's the biggest issue that we face as humanity on this planet right now. So I began actively looking for other expeditions, things I could be involved in to work with teams, teams of educators and scientists. This led me to the Ocean Watch and Around the Americas experience, where I would be part of a 28,000-mile circumnavigation of the North and South American continents by sailboat, something that had never been done before. And we would be stopping, meeting with scientists. We had scientists on board. We also had educators and a whole curriculum. We partnered with NASA, with NOAA, with MIT, different uh, marine schools like Scripps. So it was an unbelievable experience for me to be able to be on this whole voyage around the Americas, uh, to start from Seattle, and this time go from west to east through the Arctic, all the way around studying the oceans and the issues in the oceans that we all face and to also try to turn kids on to ocean, oceanography, ocean and sea issues and get them interested in studying and maybe becoming scientists. We're doing all of this various science on board. I'm happy to answer some questions afterwards about what we were doing. But um, for instance, the microtops, this was um, a unit that we would use every day to do shots toward the sun and uh, we could measure the amount of aerosols in the atmosphere, those particulates that are depositing in the Arctic, some of that dark matter. So we were looking at that. We were doing um, weather observations for NOAA. We're the smallest ocean-going weather ship in the world for NOAA. And uh, that was pretty ex exciting, and uh, lots of other things along the way. We had a full-time oceanographer with us, Michael Reynolds here, this is Michael, so we were, we, were doing, um, we were doing ocean column readings every day down to a certain depth, so we were profiling the ocean, taking a lot of measurements every single day. We were doing education. This is uh, Roxanne Neninga, who is our Spanish-speaking educator, but this is in uh, Los Angeles on the West Coast, and this is in New York City on the USS aircraft carrier Intrepid. And uh, that's me in the background uh, telling my story about growing up in Iowa a long ways from the ocean and uh, having a dream to get out there and explore just like uh, I challenge some of you to do also. And so off we went, this time on Ocean Watch, a steel vessel, Google camera taking 50,000 images a day. 
um, over two million by the time we were done. Some poor research student is still looking through those things at the University of Washington. By the way, there's no doubt that this was a camera of opportunity that could take anything and stitch all this together all around the vessel. We had carbon fiber kayaks. We had satellite communication. We filed over 200 stories internationally of our voyage during this time around the Americas. Uh, rough sailing, but really good sailing as we sailed up to the Gulf of Alaska. And then uh, finally we got into the ice near Point Barrow. And Point Barrow is a very interesting place because it exemplifies what's going on in the Arctic with this new issue of coastal erosion as these communities start melting and their permafrost is leaving their areas. It's actually causing their shorelines to crumble. And without this ice in the sea there, they're getting more wave action. And the winds are now pushing the seas when it blows for a long period of time. So they're getting storm surges, as you found out from Hurricane Sandy here, getting storm surges, getting the tide, getting wave action that is now tearing apart their communities all throughout these uh, upper Arctic regions. And uh, Barrow is no exception. We went out with scientists and looked at a lot of the uh, permafrost issues that were going on with scientists that were studying the uh, frozen tundra out there that is not so frozen anymore and looking at the methane issues, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. But this is also the area of the bowhead whale. And I won't go into this in great detail, but the bowhead whale is one of the great conservation stories of all time. Uh, was nearly hunted to extinction by the Yankee whaling fleets in the 19th century. And there were just um, maybe a thousand, maybe a couple thousand that, that survived and had been um, basically hunted by the local uh, Eskimo Inuit hunters over the years. And um, so this period of history was kind of forgotten for a long period of time. But a moratorium was put on the hunting. So the, the local peoples that have hunted these whales forever were um, not allowed to hunt for a period of time. This created a big controversy and also an opportunity for conservation to take place. So this is the foremost authority of the bowhead whale scientist in the world named Craig George. And he worked together with the Inuit Eskimo hunting community of the far north. They still hunt whales for their communities, sustainable harvesting, and he's a multi-generational hunter. They work together uh, as a conservation team to literally bring the bowhead whale back from the brink of extinction. And it's just a great conservation story, one of the um, probably most successful in the world, in history. And we were very fortunate that the bowhead whales came in. Their numbers are back up. Uh, they came in while we were there on Ocean Watch, which was very unusual that the bowheads came in to visit us. Now, news flash. As of this morning, usually I talk about a little different section here um, because many of you know Shell Oil uh, went to the Arctic this summer to drill exploratory wells. And as of this morning, Shell Oil has announced that they are pulling out of the Arctic, not necessarily forever, but for the foreseeable future. Their drilling operations were not successful. That is a really good, good thing. So um, Shell will be pulling out their operations. This was a $7 billion investment for them, no small sum. They put a lot of effort into this, and um, they just did not produce enough oil when they started exploring up there this summer. So they're pulling their operations out. This is a big, big story. So please uh, read about this today in, in the current events. And this is important because... As I talk about, uh, these, hump or these uh, bowhead whales that had survived all of the hunting and, and nearly e extinction issues migrate along this area of Alaska. And this was a spill scenario from the area where Shell is drilling, and this is a spill scenario from the uh, northern slope of the Alaska uh, National Wildlife Refuge area. So you can see that any spill in these areas would be catastrophic to the wildlife in these regions. So uh, good news for the bowhead whale um, that migrates along this shoreline, 
unbelievable news. And also for many of the, the birds, this is a spectacular place for waterfowl that um, use this area for nesting and then migration. And porcupine caribou, uh, 500,000 in these herds that uh, migrate into these areas also. So we're seeing some progress. But the folks that live up there are still facing an area that's changing quickly from this uh, Arctic environment that's being affected by climate change, the most rapidly changing place on the planet right now. In some areas, it's warm 10 to 12 degrees just in the last 20 years. So they're having to change quickly. When you talk to them about whether climate change exists or not, they pretty much say, we don't have time to argue about it. We're just trying to adapt to the changes right now. We went to visit scientists that were working all around this region, and I'll point out a couple and then we'll kind of uh, wrap it up for some questions. But this is uh, George Devoki. He is a quirky ornithologist that lives on a barrier island about 30 miles offshore of Barrow, Alaska. And he's been out there for 40 years on this little island that's one by three miles. Here it is. Highest point, three feet. So when he first went out there, there was still permafrost on, on that island late in the 70s. And uh, there were also these little birds that he discovered called the black guillemot. Well, at the time, he could dig down, hit the permafrost, store some food out there. That was his natural refrigeration. Now there is no more permafrost, so he has had to change how he operates on the island. And uh, so we went to visit his little camp here. He used to live in this little tent. Now he lives in this little shack. And... Uh, he, he doesn't live there all year, that would be impossible, but he lives there for an extended period in the summer, about five months long, and works with the University of Washington. So he's out there all alone. We went into his little hut there, and he started telling us all about living on this island and what he's discovered there with his little birds, the black guillemot. So when he first went out there, he discovered that there were these leftover military boxes, these pill boxes from the Korean War period. And these birds, who normally had not traveled that far north, as many bird species are right now, are moving, trickling farther, farther north all the time into areas that have never been seen before. And the light bulb went off. He said, I'm going to study this black guillemot and see what's happening with the species. He found his research project. So after 20 years of being on this island, um, something had changed, and he didn't quite know what it was, but he discovered that his birds um, now had a 10-day longer breeding season. So he started looking for what was the trigger, what was the mechanism that was changing the species. Well, he found in doing the research that along the northern coast of Alaska and Point Barrow, just 30 miles away, that the snow and ice was receding and melting five days earlier per decade during those first uh, 20 years that he had been there. So 10 days less snow and ice along the northern coast means 10 day longer breeding season for his birds. He did not go there to study climate change. He went there to study a species. The species taught him that climate change is taking place in the far north. And that's what he witnessed. He also had never seen a polar bear for 28 years because they had good ice to get out on to eat, to hunt, to hunt their seals. And um, now polar bears were swimming and running into his island and starving. They were eating his birds, eating his eggs, and trying to eat George. So when you ask George, do you believe in climate change? He goes, no. You don't believe in climate change. Climate change is happening. It's just, a, it's just a fact. It's happening. It's taking place. But I do believe in polar bears. And because there weren't any polar bears for 28 years, and now there are polar bears, tells me that something is definitely changing in the Arctic. He was very funny. He also said that if we were watching another planet lose its polar ice cap in a matter of just a couple decades, we would be going, holy cow, look at what's happening to this planet up here. They're losing their ice cap, and yet while we lose our northern polar ice cap, we're still down here debating whether climate change is even real and taking place. So points to, to uh, talk about in your classes and beyond. We ventured on, along the coast to a little town called Tuktoyaktuk in the Canadian Arctic, where I met a, a hunter there and fisherman named Wayne Thrasher. Wayne was just finishing up his catch for the season. These are whitefish. And um, he had gill netted about 300 whitefish 
during this period of time and he was cleaning them up and you can see in the back there he's got a little smoke shack where he's hanging his fish and he was going to dry them out and then put them into his refrigeration in the permafrost well he was making a, a bucket of muck tuck at the time uh, he had also just harvested a uh, beluga whale so this is beluga whale and whitefish in this muck tuck and uh, so I did not take a photograph of him for a full day we just talked I was trying to earn his trust and he would stick that knife down in in there and hand me some uh, muck tuck to eat and uh, I have to tell you that I was not used to that taste or texture and so while I turned different shades of green and yellow and every other color under the rainbow he got a big chuckle and I earned his trust and so therefore I got to go to the ice cave and the ice cave in Tuktoyaktuk is this magnificent structure 30 deep down under the Arctic Ocean um, kind of hard to see with the light here the way it is but this is basically frozen seawater this is permafrost. These are rooms under the ocean. There's 19 rooms there in this community ice house. And this is where they keep their food. So we took his muktuk down there and some of the fish. And this is where he was going to keep them in the natural refrigeration for the season to feed his family and friends uh, or whoever happens to come into the community. Now, unfortunately, only about five of the 19 rooms are being used anymore because they're losing their traditional ways in the far north as the Western diet gets introduced and uh, modern refrigeration and all that kind of stuff, which has also introduced things like uh, uh, diabetes and obesity and all kinds of other problems within these communities of the far north. So we sat in there and talked about all these things in his ice house. He told me about how many of these little communities along the, along the coast who did not have uh, their ice houses built so well and so deep were now melting in various areas. So they were also having to lose communities, uh, move communities to different places and changing their cultures along this coastline. So onward we went. That's me up in the uh, spreader. I usually sat up high in the mast looking for open leads in the ice. I have my cameras and binos and radio, and I could talk with the crew. Remember, it's 24-7 daylight as we proceeded onward. This is when you go through the Arctic. This is what it looks like when you're facing the ice and what you go through. It's like solving those little puzzles. Remember in that, uh, some of you may remember, there was a magazine called Highlight or something that... Um, you would have these little puzzles where, as a kid, you would have to find your way through and out of the maze. And I always enjoyed those puzzles. And this is exactly what it was like because this is a mirage. It doesn't exist. That's what we call ice blink. It's not a cloud system. It's a mirage. This is ice off in the distance, which looks like it's really, really thick and impenetrable. When you get close, it looks like this. And these were long bands of ice. This was the only ice we encountered in 2009 when we went through the passage. And it had melted from previous seasons and refrozen. So it was old ice frozen into new ice in long bands. So we were having to go sometimes one or two miles in one direction in order to go 600 feet. So in and out, in and out of this maze, we finally got through it. It took us about a day and a half to go 70 miles and uh, parting some ice flows. Uh, we had a steel vessel, but we also had underwater instruments that we couldn't hit or trip because it would uh, create a problem with water coming through the hull. And eventually we went right through the Northwest Passage again in 2009, no problem, one season again. So west to east, this time we got out into the Atlantic Ocean and uh, I wrote in my journal that um, I had witnessed, really witnessed the end of the golden era of exploration. That this era of exploration had come to a close and a new era of exploration involving the study and change of the Earth's climate was just beginning. Um, in just this short period of time, I had really bridged these two eras of exploration just within 15 to 20 years of my short life to kind of prove that we are witnessing something on this planet that humans have never really experienced before, and that is man-made climate change that is driving the cycle that we live in. So we eventually went all the way around the Americas, 28,000 miles, back into Seattle, got a chance to uh, speak with thousands and thousands of school children and work with lots of scientists along the way, 
fantastic experience, and that's what drives me every single day to get out community by community and conversation uh, by conversation and have these kinds of discussions. And so I thank you for having me here today at uh, Raritan, at RV, and um, I am very happy to answer any questions at this time. Thanks.